Today I want to complete part three of our series that starts with why. And it's been a great series and, and we're answering some of the common questions that come up, not only by Christians, but think about this, the most common questions that a non-Christian might ask a Christian. So maybe you don't have all these questions yourself. Maybe you settle these certain issues in your heart, but you can help others get past them. That might be the barrier between them and their relationship with God. So on the last day, we're going to tackle three more. And the first one, I'll go reverse order to tell you what's coming. The first one is, does God really love me? And, and this tends to be oftentimes a situational question when we get down or we feel like we're being beat up for no reason or maybe we just feel like um, we don't feel worthy. We make a mistake. People come up with all kinds of reasons to question whether God really loves them. Sometimes it's about the nature of God, which can be a mystery, or it can be questioning ourselves. And number two, Pastor Troy, is can I trust God? <laughs> and that has been coming up a lot today. Many people, and what I'm going to do, the Holy Spirit's going to call us out today. And oftentimes we say we trust God, but we really don't. If we get right down to it, we're trusting God in natural things we're trusting in things and because does this being that exists off in the heavenly somewhere that i cannot see with my natural eyes i cannot touch with my natural hands but i'm supposed to put my trust in him for my whole life are we really doing that and then the first question we're going to deal with this morning i'll spend the most time on this one is why can i not stop doing blank fill in the blank why can i not stop doing this take five seconds think about your life and in this room i feel that there are probably many people who have a habit that you just can't break why can't i stop losing my temper why can't i stop overeating why can't i stop looking at pornography why can't I stop listening to gossip? Why can't I stop running late? I told the 9 o'clock service, that's for the 1045 people running late. Uh, I can't stop running late. Why can't I stop being jealous when other people get blessed? And I feel like I'm not being blessed. Or you can even look at this in a reverse order and say, why can't I start fill in the blank, right? Why can't I start exercising? Why can't I start my morning devotions? Because as a Christian, at times, we sincerely want to stop doing something, and we can't. Why? Well, I think oftentimes we have the right intentions, but the wrong strategy. And this is coming from a man who's had to change a lot of things over the years in my life. And I still have to, because every season, to be effective in your current season you have to change things that weren't was not there in the last season that's part of life so there's no way i can fully address the theology of change in 30 minutes but the truth is so let me say this there are always some secondary reasons that vary from person to person in your circumstance of why you struggle to start or stop doing things we want to start and stop and it can be things like just you just got the wrong mindset, right? Because you hang around people with the wrong mindset. It could be things, a whole other in this space. It could be a chemical thing. It can be physical. It can be emotional. But I would submit to you today that at the root of why we can't change something, there's always at least in part a spiritual issue. In other words, that issue is there's some kind of void and disconnect with us and God's power to change that power that we all have access to. And I'm gonna go and head and narrow it down even further. As a pastor, I think most people can't change in part because they're more focused on religion than about the power of the grace of God. What is religion? Religion is our attempt to earn God's approval 
by following all the rules perfectly. It's our attempt to please God and earn his love and favor by following and obeying every law. Let me give you some good news this morning from the book of Titus, chapter 2, verse 11 and 12. It says, for the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. Somebody ought to shout for that this morning. That is awesome. That is, so, so that is great news. Then it makes a statement about grace, and this is what I hope we can catch today that may surprise you. It says, it teaches us the grace of God now to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and live a self-controlled, upright, godly life in this present age. We miss the spiritual power of the grace of God. We are saved by grace alone, and grace makes salvation available to all people. It appeared, Titus said, through Jesus Christ. That is great news. The word grace comes from the root word cheris. The word cheris means the unmerited goodwill and favor of God. And Troy, we saw a great example this morning, and I'll use you as my example we, you had an assignment. You came on the stage to greet the people, and part of that assignment is always to call the altar workers down. And I saw the, the pain on your face when you came off, and you looked at Lisa, who's the head of the prayer ministry. I, I did, you didn't have to say it. He's like, you know, I forgot again. And do you know that those people came down anyway, and there was never a moment they were not occupied by somebody getting prayer? That is called the grace of God. <laughs> Because Troy didn't mean to forget that, and God's bigger than our mistakes. And his grace covered Pastor Troy, and I thought that was a cool example of what we're talking about. I think the way Christians, guys, we get into trouble because our ability to change hurts our ability to change when we understand that we're saved by grace and God forgives me when I'm born again. I think everybody gets that for the most part. But after that, we come under that yoke of religion again because it's so hard for human beings not to apply the natural rules of life to the supernatural relationship with God. We're taught that we must earn everything we get. So the concept of living out of a place of grace where Christ lives through me, it can, I just, people just can't wrap their head around it sometimes. After we're born again, many just fall back into the thinking, especially my men. It's all on me now because I'm a Christian and I have to try hard to check all these boxes to be a great example for my family. I have to check all these boxes and it comes from a place of some sincerity, but we have to look in the mirror and say it also comes from a place of pride. Because we want to get it all right. We want to do it ourselves. And even if that desire to please God is sincere, we slip back into religion and this pressure to get everything right. We think we have to keep earning everything and the ability to change a habit or a desire that doesn't line up with the Bible comes through grit and determination alone because that's how people think and that's really how Americans think. And so we're forever focused on the wrong things. Religion constantly focuses on the outward. I'm going to stop smoking. I am going to stop smoking. I am going to stop losing my temper. I am going to stop running up my credit card. I am going to stop looking at pornography. Jesus talked about how dangerous and ineffective that focus of your life can be on the outward, outward, outward. He told the Pharisees, that we need to know today that you clean the outside of the cup only. Matthew 23, 25, Jesus says, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but the inside you're still full of greed and self-indulgent. You blind Pharisee. Now catch the order of change from Jesus. First clean the inside of the cup and the dish, then the outside will be clean. It's a natural byproduct. Did you catch that? Did you catch the order of lasting change and how it happens? When I walk in God's grace and I understand 
It means that I am now clothed in the righteousness of Jesus. Inside, I am now clean by grace. The outside just changes over time. It is unavoidable because the grace of God brings power of God living through me. Somebody shout for that this morning. That is awesome. So you see, God's grace works on the inside and brings power from heaven. Religion focuses on the outside, trying to please God, oftentimes to impress men as well. So grace focuses on the inside because if you simply change your behavior and not your heart, what happens? It never lasts. The behavior comes back because you're doing it out of religion, not relationship. Religion says, try harder. But grace says, trust God more and let him live through me, die to myself. On Wednesday nights, we've been walking through the book of Matthew, and there's a reference several times by Jesus, and we know this phrase of what it means to have mustard seed faith and letting the habits and values. We talked about the leaven, right, working through our life. Sometimes the the bad stuff can work through there, and God gave us at least to me, this cool revelation of what mustard seed faith is. I've heard it forever, but something fresh hit me. I know that it's the smallest plant and the purest seed. Mustard seed faith is the opposite, this is what hit me fresh, of diluted faith. Diluted, you dilute something means you mix it with something else, right? You you mix that water, you mix something in there And what you're doing is, this is too strong. I don't like really bitter stuff, so I don't like really strong lemonade. So I'm one of these guys, hey, just fill it up halfway. I'm going to dump some water in there, right? Because I'm trying to dilute the strength of it. Diluted faith means this. Yeah, I have faith in God, but the truth is, I'm putting my faith in a lot of things to make things happen for me. If I'm really honest, I have faith in God, but I'm also putting my faith in my bank account. I get nervous when it gets low. I have faith in God, but I also have faith in my education. I have faith in God, but you know what? I also have faith in the connections that I have. You know what? Mustard seed faith brings us back to 100% invested our faith in one thing, and that is God alone. Those things have their place, but only God. And when you do that, your faith actually explodes because with God, all things are possible. Think about that mentally for a minute. It's really helping me. Well, if I'm putting faith in my bank account and God, well, that just mutes God's power because what if my bank account's empty? I'm putting faith in God and my connections. Well, what if I lose those connections? But if I just say, it's only you, God, then the sky's the limit. Oh, I'm about to get excited up here. Come on. You got to get that shift. So the grace that saves you is also the grace that sustains you. The grace that saves you is the grace. It's so easy after you're born again to slip back into religion because that's the system of the world we live in. Everything must be earned. And that's not all bad because the Bible does say we reap what we sow. And I know I can see your wheels turning out there. You know, Pastor Richard, you got to earn it. You got to earn it. We reap what we sow. Well, I'm ready for you this morning. You thought you were going to get me. I I got theology for that. So let's go back one step, if that's what you're struggling with right now in your mind, and ask you this. We might know that we reap what we sow, but what is actually determining what you sow? Because you still got the habit, don't you? And you're sowing something wrong because that habit's still there. In other words, knowing something is one thing. The power to do it is something different. So let's go back one step. The power to change what we sow, I promise you, comes from the inside. And religion is rooted in pride and performance and our own strength. Grace is rooted in brokenness and letting Christ live through me because the pressure to earn something is now gone. I don't have that pressure anymore. And God's grace is always enough. That's what I've learned. 
Where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. The Bible says if I get caught in a situation, if I forget to tell the altar workers to come down, if I do this or that, the Bible says I'll always have a way of escape because that's grace. Not that I've earned a way of escape. I'm probably in a situation right now in you that you don't deserve a way of escape by human standards, but by the grace of God, he will give you that. That's what grace is. Religion requires grace enables. Religion is about rules. Grace is about relationship. Religion is about condemnation when you fail. Grace is about letting the Holy Spirit lovingly convict me without condemning me and showing how to let Christ live through me as I change from the inside out. Let's make the shift today from religion to grace and lasting change will come if you believe it, say amen. Amen. All right, you could you could have came and just gotten that, but I got so much more for you. Now, another question that comes a lot, even with the cycle of religion, is the second question. Does God really love me? Look at the person next to you today and say, you're the one that Jesus really loves. Just tell them that. I bet that made them feel good. Now turn to the other side and tell them, he loves you too. Come on. Isn't that good? All right, stop. You're having too much fun. Come on. So if we're not sure that God loves us today, then we don't understand God's love in the most fundamental way. First, the love of God, think about this, is the one thing in the Bible that's unconditional. Everything else, there's something we have to do. Even salvation, by grace, you have to pray a prayer. You have to step forward. God's love, you don't have to do anything but be born. Even before he formed you in the womb, he knew you and he loved you. You don't have to be, even have a relationship with him yet for him to love you. He loves everybody equally. And you know what I've learned? The love of God is so strong, I can even use it as a spiritual weapon against the devil. I can say, get behind me, Satan, because God still loves me anyway. You can't condemn me when I make a mistake. And the world's love is completely different. Because the world only loves something because the object or the person in their mind is worthy of that love. We love something because an object or a person is valuable and gives us pleasure. And we all have things in our life that we love and are valuable to us because we worked for them and we earned it. And that is not a bad thing. Although I was thinking this week I probably should say I like these things, not love these things. I like my new shoes. Can I get an amen? I like my motorcycle that I ride. I rode it a week ago, and it was awesome. I like certain restaurants. I like certain beaches. And you know what I've learned recently? I like a car with heated seats. Can I get an amen in here? My car used to have heated seats. Now I got one that doesn't. My hiney's so cold when I get in there. I shouldn't have said hiney. I'm sorry. Um, When it comes to God's love, The problem for many people is they never really felt valuable to begin with. They never really felt worthy. Never really felt like they measured up to even their own expectations, much less the standards of God. It loved, here's God's love. He loves you in spite of the fact that you're flawed. He loves you in spite of the fact that you're broken. He loves you in spite of the fact that you're wounded this morning. You must know to stop hiding those things from God. You don't have to hide those things from God. He loves you anyway. Because first of all, he's God and he already knows it. Secondly, God demonstrates his love for us how? The Bible says, while I was still a sinner, God died for me. Come on, you wanna hear that? I want you to hear that like you've never heard it before. I want you to get in your mind and your heart that God loves us with an unconditional, immeasurable love. It is the kind of love that doesn't look for what's worthy and beneficial in a person so he will have a reason to love it, but it's the love of God that gives worth to a person. In other words, our God doesn't love you because you're worthy by some human standard. His love makes me worthy and gives me value, and it's unconditional. Nothing can take it away from me. 1 John chapter 4, 
7 through 10, says, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. That is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and gave his son as an atoning sacrifice for my sins. This book of the Bible was not written by John the Baptist. It was written by John, the brother of James. And John and James were characters in the Bible. They were people, they weren't, you know, disciple material. They didn't graduate at the head of the seminary class. They were rough, they were mean, they drank, they cursed, they were fishermen with a reputation, okay? And they had a nickname, and that nickname was Sons of Thunder. In Luke chapter 9, people were not being very nice to Jesus, and the Sons of Thunder, who were barely saved, didn't like it. In Luke 9, 54, they said, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven and destroy them? Yeah, the Sons of Thunder didn't start fights, they finished fights. Can I get an amen? But then John started spending time with Jesus, and even though... He didn't do anything to earn the love of Jesus or deserve the love of Jesus. Jesus just simply loved on John and poured life into John, poured value into John. In other words, he focused on what he could become, not what he was. And John's identity began to change. And the way he saw himself started to change. How do we know? Because in the gospel refers to him three times as the disciple that Jesus loved. Because that's what the love of God is, and that's how it works, guys. Think about it. Jesus said, I'll leave the 99 and go after the one. And he didn't clarify the search. He didn't say like the world does, I'll go after only the strong sheep, the sheep doing the most for my kingdom. I'll go after the sheep that's the easiest to love. I'll go after the sheep that gives me the most benefit. No, he says, I'll go after any sheep. If you belong to me, I don't care if you're hanging by a thread. I don't care if you're in the valley or on the mountaintop. There's no distinction in your value in the eyes of God because his love for you today is real and nothing can separate you from it. I want everybody to say with all your heart, I am the one that Jesus loves. Will you say that? It feels good to say it. So the final question I ask you today is can I trust God? And that is a question that has haunted me this week. Do I really trust God? Because I want to trust Him. Do I, this being that I can't see with my eyes or hear with my physical ears, can I trust Him with my past, my present, and the future of my life? When the chips are down, most people don't trust God. They trust themselves. They trust the people around them. I've said it before, wisdom can become the enemy of faith. Because the longer you live, you know, the longer Christian lives, the more sense he gets, right? <laughs> he said, yes, don't you do that. I'm going to smack you. The more sense you get, the wiser you get, the more you love your wife. I see it happening. But Christian, that could become the enemy of faith. Because we learn how to self-contain. We learn, we get in a cycle of blessing. You know, that's what I say. When people become a Christian, they get a social lift. Because they do learn about sowing and reaping. They do learn that God wants to bless them. But if that ever reaches a point, we start trusting in all this physical stuff rather than God, that's when we get in trouble. That's when we stop taking risk. That's when we stop doing what he's called us to do. And I love the verse that he referenced earlier is Psalm 27. Some trust in chariots, some in horses, but we trust, King David said, in the name of the Lord my God. And he was about to face a circumstance, a battle, and whether we will put our trust in the practical provision that we can see or God to bring the victory. David has seen enough to know 
To win the battle, it's not how much money you have, it's not how many chariots you have or how many horses you have. Your victory will be determined by the favor and protection of God and nothing else. And that's how he learned to trust in God. When it comes to what I trust in, I admit to you today that I'm vulnerable to be part of the sum that trusts more in things that I can see, sometimes in a God I can't see. Our ability to trust God is going to be tested through your whole life. And it comes when you don't feel like you know where our life and circumstances are headed. So we have no place to release our faith. Do you understand? Trust is what we do when we don't know the plan yet. See, there's this cycle in life, right? And we go through it. And the first thing the devil is trying to do today is trying to steal your hope. He doesn't want you to have hope because hope is the ingredients of faith and trust. So I want to tell you, don't lose hope today. If you lose hope, the devil's got you where he wants you. Do not lose hope. Everybody say hope. Keep your hope. And then you fight through and then you begin to say, God, I have faith. But the problem is, if you don't know the plan yet, you don't know where to release your faith, right? So in between hope and in between faith is a season of trusting God. You trust him because you don't know the plan yet. So you can't release your faith. And I've learned that discipline over the years. I'm not going to release my faith until I know what God is saying. Now, once God speaks, all in, man. You can speak it. You can go after it. You can dream it, dream big. But life so many times is about waiting. Before David makes a statement of trust, he went through a process to get there. In Psalm 13, 1 and 2, the guy who just said what we heard in Psalm 20 wrote, How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? So I'm going to invite the worship team to come on back. I'm going to end with three questions that have helped me learn to trust God. And they're in a certain order. If you're with me, say amen. First of all, I'm going to give you permission today to question God. It's okay to question God. The Bible says, come let us reason together. I didn't say blame God, but I said question God. And I can promise you God would rather you come to him with your questions than run away from him in your doubt. And when I'm afraid to trust God, it, it is when I, I, I need to bring my questions to God. And I, I'll give you an example. As a spiritual leader, sometimes I've learned people just want to be heard. You know, they don't even want me to necessarily do what they're asking. If I will look them in the eye and say, tell me what you think, something comes over them, a peace that they can trust me as a spiritual leader. And I want you to know you have that kind of relationship with God. You can come to God and say, God, I don't understand this. God, just think about the way David just talked to God. How long, Lord? These are all questions he gave. Will you forget about me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long will I wrestle with my thoughts? How long will my enemies triumph over me? Oftentimes, God can handle your questions this morning. And if we just come to him in an honorable way, then everything's going to be okay. And then you can go to step two. Then you pray. Now, we could combine step two and step one because questioning God is certainly a form of prayer. But I think once, what I've learned once I walk through my questions, even if it's just to get it off my chest, even if God doesn't give me the clearest of answers, the nature of my prayers begin to change. With the measure of trust, I can now pray to God after I've gotten my fears off my chest. And that leads to number three, surrender. Everybody say surrender. What does surrender mean? It means I choose to trust God even when I don't fully understand what's happening in my situation. And God's Proverbs 
three, three, five, and six, I'll end with this. It's such a great scripture. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. All your heart. That is hard to do. And then he gives you a strategy. Lean not to your own understanding. I mean, don't just throw wisdom out the window, but some things are not going to make sense. God does mysterious things. Stop trying to figure this out with your head and trust me. And when you do that, he says, in all your ways acknowledge him and he'll make your path straight. The Hebrew word for trust here means, I love this, to stretch out and lie face down before God like a servant waiting for the master's word of command. So today, we're going to stand to our feet if you go ahead and do that. Are you thankful for God's word this morning? Amen. Hallelujah. So in just a second, we're going to worship. I encourage you, don't leave yet. We're not done. If you have to go, go. But we'll, we'll beat the Baptist to the cafeteria. Don't worry. We're going to be out of here in a few minutes. But let's, let's do this. Are you looking for the power to stop doing something today? we got to understand it comes from the inside out. And maybe God's trying to remind you of the power of his grace today. You're trying too hard. You're trying in your own strength. Just let go and let God do it on the inside. Quit worrying about the outside. Secondly, I want to tell you that God loves you this morning. And it's different than the world's kind of love. You got to get that. His love gives you value. And nothing can ever separate you from that love. And then I want to tell you, you can trust God this morning. Stop trusting in chariots and trusting in horses and learn to trust in God alone. Come to God and ask your questions. Pray and then surrender to him and watch his peace come over you. So as we worship, the altars are open. I exhort you to come. Sometimes you just need to walk down here. God can do more with one. God can do a lot in just a few moments. We're going to give him a few more moments, and then we're going to go about our day. But don't shortchange this moment. Just come to the altar if you need to come. And before we worship, would you just bow your head? I want to give one more invitation for people to meet Jesus. We just heard of a young man, 24 years old, at Faith Christian Ministries. His heart was ready. Laura and Selena didn't know that, but God did. And somebody in here today, your heart may be ready to meet Jesus. So God's in control of that. It's our job to be obedient and give the invitation. So right now, if you've never met Jesus Christ as your Savior, God loves you. He couldn't love you anymore, but he loves you so much, he wants to show you his plan for your life. And that comes through relationship. He wants to give you the gift of salvation. Do you want to know beyond a shadow of a doubt if you were to die today, you would go to heaven? You can know that through just praying a simple prayer. Sal salvation is a gift, but you have to receive it by faith. Or you may say, I'm met God years ago, but my relationship is dead, it's cold, the pilot light has gone out in my spirit, I'm not praying, I'm not reading my Bible, I'm not doing anything of eternal value, I need to recommit my life to Jesus. Today. It is that simple. You can just pray that prayer and everything will change. I did it in 1988, I've never been the same since. Do you need to meet Jesus? I'm going to count to three and then I want you to just lift your hand. We're just praying for you and you lift it high. One, two, three, do I need to meet Jesus? If you need to meet him, recommit to him. Lift your hand high just so I'll know, so I can pray for you. Come on, don't hesitate. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, sir. I see that hand. Who else needs to join this young man and meet Jesus as their Savior this morning? For there's one, there may be more. We're praying for you. Not trying to talk you into it, but it's important. Because this is the starting point where you can go forward and be changed. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this young man who's lifted his hand. And I want us all to pray with him. 
Would you pray this after me? Lord Jesus, I thank you for being my Savior. I ask you now to come into my heart and fill me with your Holy Spirit. I receive your forgiveness of my sins and I receive your gift of eternal life in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. Can we rejoice with the angels on that right there? That's good. Hallelujah.